Hello there, I'm David Bradley aka Schizophreniforms and this is hopefully not a test run but it might end up being a test run of an article I wrote, it's about 17 pages long I'm gonna elaborate, dip in and out of it, see how it goes, see if I feel comfortable speaking on camera again which fingers crossed I do and it's basically something I wrote called Psychic Communication um, and the basic gist is it, I might show examples of people who claim to experience telepathy uh, and analyze, the, analyze their methodologies, find out what the actual mechanisms are behind it if at all possible and then find out ways in which that apparent ability can be enhanced, enhanced and made repeatable so creating the illusion, specifically illusion, of telepathy in a measurable and repeatable format so I've spent a long time, a little preface sincerely experiencing and sincerely believing myself with obviously a, hopefully a healthy dose of scepticism and doubt to be essentially telepathic that's my direct experience and one of the reasons I take my medication and have done for such a very long time for the schizophrenia which is my diagnosis has been to suppress or at least mediate the stress caused by the experience of being telepathic um, so I wrote this article basically um, as a way of analyzing more or less if there was any use or merit to any of my experiences or whether they were even relevant and how it might be possible to recreate it in other people or with other people with similar conditions learn to master it through the recreation but more or less we'll just see how it goes so I'll start reading so uh, a discussion of the illusion of telepathy sorry psychic communication curating the illusion of telepathy in a measurable and repeatable format a discussion of the illusion of telepathy and how it can be used as a tool for greater social coherence chapter one how to become a telepath it's 17 pages long, hopefully we'll get through this in a couple of sections, but I might be able to like tag them around here somewhere so you can skip through. Section 1. What is telepathy? Defining telepathy. Telepathy in modern culture and antiquity. Perceptions and truth. Charlatans and fraudsters. Corrupting a methodology. Real telepathy. Demystifying the unknown. And in fact, I'm going to stop myself here rather than reading through the names of all the sections. There's three sections, which is how to become a telepath, what is telepathy, what is telepathy really and how can we use it is section two, and how can this skill further be han han harnessed and utilised. So section one, what is telepathy? I'm sure most people know what the word means, but the etymology of telepathy breaks down as tele meaning transfer over distance and pathy from the Greek pathia which is feeling or perception. So to achieve true telepathy we must be able to transfer feelings or perceptions over distance assumedly without direct contact or dialogue taking place. Here is important to point out that we're discussing the perception of others thoughts feelings and dialogues as telepathy without any medium of transference otherwise things like I don't know I don't know why I wrote this, but otherwise television and many other things could be misappropriately identified as telepathy. Um, in particular, I'll be discussing and analysing mind-to-mind -mind communication of personal experiences such as emotions, images, feelings, perceptions and ideas without apparent external communications, aka not speech and not via an interface, technological or otherwise, of any kind. Because you can do... I can't remember how to describe it, but uh, the Michio Kaku, or whatever his name is, was talking about it. You can actually do a lot of telepathic things using electro stimuli, and um, I don't really know enough about it, but you put something on your head and you can touch your arm, and the other person feels it, and so on and so forth. And there's all this kind of stuff through. So, we're not talking about technological versions of that, we're not talking about direct, specific, intended conversation, aka speech. So body language and non-verbal communication will however be included and the reason for this is that I attribute a huge amount of seemingly telepathic communication to non-verbal communication 
and in fact I would suggest that these methods of interaction along with internalization or modeling of other beings is telepathy and further that there Further, that the idea that there is anything or should be anything paranormal is occurring is a reason why previous accounts of attempts to make telepathy a usable skill with repeatable results have failed. And a little sort of addendum to that. Um, how can I explain what I mean to say? So there's nothing paranormal. There may be like supranormal or like heightened levels of experience or uh, states of agitation and we'll go into that further on with it may appear to have a supernatural function but a lot of the time I'm going to try and be brief because I'll probably discuss it later on in the document but a lot of the time being in a heightened sensory state of awareness or being in a state of agitation can trigger unused senses like the sense of being watched for example um all animals, all species, seem to have, especially animals that suffer predation, as far as more it's all animals. But yeah, if you are a prey animal, you are very acutely aware of whether you're being watched or whether some, whether you're watching someone else in the case of predator animals. And it's been, there's loads of actual data on that. It's just a sense we have. You, you can pick it up. There's experiments you can do. I'll probably talk about that a bit more, but I've got it down to the point where like it kind of freaks people out on occasion because I can get like four out of five or nine out of ten times um, accurate it's guesses basically very accurate guesses as to whether someone's looking directly at me and you can even do it in terms of you can play with the sense of being looked at because if you look at the person but you focus your attention on something else in your peripheral vision that can also be a way of subverting that process but when you get them to fully focus on you it's almost instantaneously recognizable to the sort of receiver of that that there's a sense that you're being looked at directly it's just tuning yourself into it and becoming more aware of it but it's a perfectly normal non-paranormal sense but it's only necessarily experienced in dangerous situations or states of heightened agitation as a general rule so most people aren't in tune to that sense but it is a sense so that's a little addendum there that I thought I'd sort of get in there before we move further on. So next section is telepathy in modern culture. The illusion of telepathy is inherent to the cultural dialogue surrounding the subject. Sorry, the issue with telepathy is, that was Freudian slip there, but it's, I'm talking about the illusion of telepathy further up. Um, the issue with telepathy is, the inher is inherent to the cultural dialogue surrounding the subject. Most people consider the, such ideas as either delusions held by the same, insane or mystical powers held by special people. I personally consider both of these perceptions of telepathy as false. In regards to the belief that some people who think that telepaths are suffering from delusions, I find it easier to consider that it's more a case of naivety than mental illness. For example, take religion and the creation myth. Some people believe there is a creator god that created the universe in seven days. Others believe that the universe is God playing music, so like Hinduism, more or less. Some people believe that they are deity themselves and no one else exists. Solipsism. I'm not here to debate whether any of these ideas are true or not, but I will say that there are many different differing beliefs. There's also the Big Bang Theory and the scientific knowledge, but that's not really a belief, so I think that's probably why I didn't include it. I'm not here to debate whether these ideas are true or not, but I will say that there are many differing beliefs about how the universe came to be, some of which contradict each other heavily, and that these beliefs are in, are not fact by their very nature, because if they could be proved by facts, they would not be belief, they would be knowledge, an incontrovertible fact. I would argue this, is, this can be likened to the misapprehension that telepathy is either real or a delusion. People that believe they are telepathic have not got in controvertible facts about their abilities generally speaking and so in place of facts all sorts of weird and wonderful ideas of how telepathy is achieved have been made up and spread throughout the world to fill in the gaps and thus the truth of what is going on has been obscured from sight so it's like yeah there's some methodology there's some perceptions that people have effectively that i'm saying that could be at least akin or very much described as a consistent illusion of telepathy and I will go on to argue this further but because they don't know how it works 
So, like, uh, Darren Brown's a brilliant example. Like, he can utilise mechanisms of observation and hypnotism and um, very in-depth knowledge about body language and behaviour, and he's very skillful and able to navigate that. Um, and it basically is kind of tele telepathy to the viewer, but then some people can, I don't know, I'll come to this later as well, but some people innately have these skills and don't understand what they're doing, but they're still able to process it. Thus, it basically is what we're talking about, the illusion of telepathy. It's essentially, they're telepathic, but they don't know how. So all of these sort of, like I said, weird and wonderful ideas tend to elaborate like how they're doing something. You see it a lot in um, I can't think of an example, but scientific experiments where people are assessed in terms of pattern following. Like, why why do why does someone think that such and such an event occurred, or how did they work out some quick math when they were spontaneously asked to do it, but then couldn't work it out if they were actually sat down to figure it out? Um, and it, it's just essentially their explanation for how they did it is nonsense, and they fill it in retroactively. But there's an instinctual click of the answer straight away and it's this is kind of the area we're talking about in terms of how telepathy works i don't think that explains it so charlatans and fraudsters the misapprehension of what telepathy is can be strongly attributed to both those with naive confusion and deliberate deception alike so there are a huge number of cases where people have been exposed as fakes in fact there's endless number of cases where people have been exposed as fakes and their deliberate deception has either become apparent through failure to perform under scrutiny or simply having their abilities exposed for what they are deception this can be done in a variety of ways such as cold reading making barnum statements using stooges that pretend to be members of an audience and all of these techniques are essentially illusionism they are illusionism in that they deceive the subject into believing something mystical is taking place rather than an act of deduction or simply lying about how they do what they do. And this deception has led to further misapprehension as to what telepathy is. I'll leave that with that section there. So real telepathy, spurious, eh? Demystifying the unknown. So what am I talking about? Telepathy is not mystical and it's not illusionism. So what is it? This is my idea of what it is. I would argue that true telepathy is a methodology of self-observation or observation in general, sensitivity and self-attenuation. It, become, it comes from observing others and oneself being sensitive to subtle changes, uh, whether they be emotional or physical or, or uh, mental, in oneself and others, and mentally aligning with, with in others and oneself and then mentally aligning one's own self and motivations with those of others it is also i believe an evolutionary strategy that i talked about this earlier it's somewhat akin to the feeling of being watched a kind of extra sense that given the proper training can be developed into a practical and useful skill so i'm going to have a little break and then i'll be on with the next section of the video which is section two section two what is telepathy really and how can we use it again this is all my own opinions and ideas so if it's bullshit correct me if it's not you think it's interesting leave a comment don't leave a comment leave a like leave a dislike don't mind um so telepathy is a combination of several distinct processes that all combine when well trained to create a very consistent illusion of telepathy in this section, I will discuss the processes I've discerned as being crucial to seemingly telepathic communication and some brief examples of how to use each one. And these ex processes will maybe be in another video, but expanded on in further in section three. I just want to, just before I go on, I genuinely seem to experience that I've, I have telepathic and empathic sensations. It's not contrived, I haven't learned it. I've learned to explain what's going on in my experience using all of these ideas and it's given me a bit better control but there's some other stuff that may be slightly inexplicable in terms of pure science and obviously but I'm doing my best to explain the phenomena I naturally experience um, 
in a rational way. So, yeah. Um, so the, the first part of section two is empathy, feeling other people's feelings or feeling others' feelings. Most of us have an inherent sense of what other people are feeling. Recent studies in neuroscience, this, this was quite a while ago now, but I wrote this ages ago, suggest that this is due to our mirror neurons. It suggests that we have an internal process that allows us to more or less almost exactly feel well, it allows us to feel what others are feeling due to these mirror neurons in such a way that it feels like we ourselves are experiencing the emotion. These neurons fire when an action is performed normally, and then also when an action is seen being performed by someone else. So, like you see someone cry, you feel a physical sadness or an, you get correlating thoughts and emotional responses, and there's actually a physical, it, neurological basis for that. It's not just... In imagination, it's 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 literally a part of the brain designated for feeling other people's emotions as accurately as possible. So that's really important factor. Then we've got body language, the unheard voice. This section is called. <coughs> Since the early our early childhoods, we have been communicating through body language. In fact, that's the only way we communicate until we learn to speak. It is an inherent process through which we both consciously and unconsciously, or subconsciously, convey and receive information through movements of the body and face. It can display an emotion, a person's emotional state, their intentions and feelings towards someone, and even their most personal thoughts if read correctly and monitored closely enough. There are countless books and resources on how to read body language, so I'll spare the details for now. I would recommend looking up a few. I think one I mentioned later on is called Blink by a guy called... Uh, Martin, I'll, I'll link it. There's a book called Blink, anyway, by a very interesting fellow. Um, so the problem most people face when reading body language is often not reading others' body language, but understanding how to communicate effectively using their own body and face without it standing out as unusual or deliberate or generally obvious. So the solution to that is the following. Visualisation, imagining the mind. So, quick preface previous section was saying everyone can read body language you can have your attention drawn to it you may not know exactly what it means when you've got your attention drawn to it but you get sensations and vibes and all these kind of things um that spontaneously arise if you're sensitive to them or hyper vigilant or hyper alert because you're in a danger situation or you're in a happy situation or uh, you feel love or affection or hatred or any variation of emotion um, you naturally read body language. That's where you get vibes from, to a certain extent at least. That's where you get the instant sensation that someone feels a certain way about you without any direct information to validate that. Uh, it could just be from a very short period, like a very snap bit of information. You suddenly get, oh, I think that person's got an issue with me. I don't know what it is. You have to verify it, but yeah. So we can all read body language, we all sense body language innately. What we struggle to do as a general thing is to consciously take an involvement in how we communicate through our body language without it seeming stifled or contrived or creepy or weird. So to be able to, next section, visualization, imagining the mind. So to be able to accurately speak body language, a few things need to be able to take place. This I struggled with this for years, so this is quite an important bit to me, but it may not may seem really apparent to you, I don't know. Um, one has to seem natural, one has to be accurate, and one has to be understood. So it has to seem not contrived or forced or fake. It has to be accurate as in people have to get the right impression and it needs to be exactly the right impression from what you're consciously trying to project. So I'd like to suggest that visualisation is a really... And this is what I do. But visualization to a certain extent, when communicating outwards the visualization plate post coming inwards it's sensitivity, outwards visualization and projection. You must visualize what you want to convey and then your body will naturally correspond to the visualization and more or less speak it to the other person. So a brief example, if you wanted to convey without speech that you were pleased with something, rather than going hmm? And like doing a conscious involvement you could dwell on the memory or visualize something that makes you happy or a fond memory or a pleasant time from the past hold it in your mind 
uh, and connect that in your own feelings with how you associate it with that person what what more or less you want them to feel but also connect it to them so that it's a sincere emotion and without so you hold that idea in your mind or in like visualize it here or here wherever you consider yourself to be uh, but you hold that emotion until you feel it quite strongly making no attempt no attempt whatsoever to conceal that emotional response and just let it come naturally and your body will literally speak like it doesn't it's probably may not seem that profound to some people but i actually found this an incredible device for navigating difficult situations or emotionally tense situations or um where people are emotionally delicate it's very useful and things like that and it's also it is basically i'll go into further detail about the other ways you can do it but visualizing exactly what you want to say even if they don't get the same image they may get the sense that is accompanying that image or the visualization and that's the important bit and your body will literally just project it outwards almost like you've commanded it like it's just it's almost like you're just here and you're just telling your whole everything about you to express that thing so you express happiness deliberately consciously yeah it seems like a really natural response now this might seem elaborate but so to make sure that the per anyway i've already kind of gone into that bit before but to exp it seems like a natural response even though you've done it more or less contrivedly but you've actually connected with a sincere level of that process so now to make sure it's understood you can gauge the empathic response or in the mirror neurons and your own uh, sensory perception in your emotion your emotional or emotional sensory perception so how you feel the response to that and then you can also gauge their body language of the other person by learning about body language at the meticulous level say like someone like darren brown might do um, and then you can consciously observe that in a relaxed and groovy nice way hopefully and this can be practiced with a friend for example with verbal checks you can ask them precisely what they meant and vice versa to ensure accuracy until the point where you can more or less speak to each other in quite a lot of detail without saying a word but like you get this in um uh, to do with uh, modeling there's this cognitive science scientist uh, john viveke i think was talking about this video called chi without the magic i probably think i might even reference this later on um old couples basically have been together for years and years and years and years can and even couples that have been together an even relatively short amount of time but have been in a lot of close contact with one another they'll essentially be able to communicate a huge swathe of detail and information with just like one look or one look or a nod or anything and because they've got such an i'll come back to this later but so they've got such an accurate model of the other person's psyche based on experience and process and habitual behaviors and uh, cognitive modeling where you internalize someone uh, to the point where your own internal impression of them is so accurate and this this happens with this as well like when you get to the point where you intuitively know someone's body language all these things are going on but it's just anyway when you know someone but it's just getting to a level where it's a conscious thing on both parts and then you can actually once you take a conscious involvement in it you can convey in much more detail much more accuracy and then if you actually practice it it becomes as as though telepathy even just with that just the information you've had so far it appears and functions like telepathy as it is so yeah that's so far so good as far as i'm concerned with this information so intuition and instinct inherent knowing so this is all good and well when working with someone you know well and have practiced with but what do you do when a person is a stranger one must, as you would imagine, use your intuition. One must try to sense what someone is thinking and feeling quickly and accurately without prior knowledge of their patterns and behaviours by their automatic response to a person and the non-conscious sense of what is going on. So this is can be something that can be trained. And just like body language, there are many subjects, many books on the subject. So about training your intuition and navigating life with less information about what's actually going on following a sense and like the gut instinct and your heart and your higher self and all this kind of stuff that people talk about which is cool and like I, I, i've read a few of them but 
I'm not going to spend any time on it here, as I said in the text. Um, what I will say, though, is that your intuition can be fooled, and sometimes quite easily. Uh, a lot of the time, your first instincts can be accurate through an innate sense of what the atmosphere of the place is, or someone's mood or intent. However, one can influence a situation unconsciously into being the way they first perceived it. So always try to be clear-headed and calm as possible, as negative situations can be brought about by not flowing with the change in mood of an environment. It's also possible that one's own mood and emotions, this is really common in people that hallucinate, for example, or have paranoia issues or delusions about other people's behaviour, um, you more or less... Uh, you have an idea in your head of what you're doing. Like we were saying, projecting before. Like, you bring about situations in social environments through, again, nothing mystical, nothing nothing particularly... nothing that's particularly a leap of the imagination, but, like, a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you go walk into a situation and you think you've clocked at everything straight away, that's going to fool you, for starters. And second, if you've got something in the background of your mind that you're insecure about or feeling negative about, that's really easy to put that out there because you're not owning it and you're not taking responsibility for it um yeah and your own mood and emotions can basically be portrayed as someone else's so that's something to be really really conscious of when you're just doing something intuitively um and it's also possible that one's own mood and emotions can obscure clarity about a person so you might think they're not a very nice person and then they react as by being a not very nice person because they sense intuitively that you feel negatively towards them so it can uh, i'll put here so again it's important to be flexible to trust to change as trusting your intuition too much can lead to major embarrassment and not to mention sometimes some pretty dangerous situations uh, you wouldn't want to drive a car by intuition alone but again being too focused on the mechanism of how to drive on the road can be distracting as well so a balance must be struck between the two sets of information and this is the key to creating the illusion of telepathy and making it a usable resource. So, effectively, I'm trying to say you've got reading information, sending information, so that's body language and visualisation, and then there's also navigating these things intuitively without too much detail so initially you have to sort of learn the methods and then you kind of put things down to a bit of a background hum because it's already imbibed and you've trained your subconscious to pick up these cues even more acutely um yeah um the next section is a bit uh spurious and i'll i'll let it explain itself but um yeah i'll stop there and then i'll move on for a bit I'll be right back. So after a quick cheeky cigarette, which I probably could have kept to myself that I'd done that, but I'm not that ashamed. I'm cut down a lot. Anyway, so we've moved on to the next section. That was the point. Hallucination. stimuli -less information. So this next section, I'll let it speak for itself and then I might elaborate because I do want to emphasize it, can be dangerous territory for most people at some stage or other, if you experience them. Relying on hallucinations as a form of psychic dialogue can often lead to embarrassment, but can further lead to serious mental illness if not practiced with care and a strict adherence to the practice of critical thinking. So take everything I say with a metaphorical pinch of salt, as the following practices can rapidly lead to delusional thinking and best discussed in private and practiced with an almost religious dedication to rationality and intellectual self-honesty. So, first and foremost, we should discuss inducing hallucinations. And you can see why I might be a bit sceptical about divulging the information, but I, I did basically this whole thing almost in reverse. Like, like I said earlier, I have these experiences, I was trying to find explanations for them, found... So the easiest and simplest explanation, I think I've said in another video before, is that I am telepathy. But what I did is try to find mechanisms that could describe it. Now, it's a huge, incredibly complex process that's going on, which I'm trying to 
sort of break down to uh, each individual section of how I think it might work. So I'm doing it retroversely or inversely, like ret retroactively filling in the information as to how this might happen so that other people can experience it. And then the main idea is that if I still have an, another capacity edit, or if someone can repeat it and have exactly the same skills and experiences, that means that my analysis of the situation, how it might be happening and why I think you can do it might be the case. And then it's just a case of something, some shift in my psyche due to being in a heightened state for such an extended period of time, um, or something like that. Um, the induced, the navigation of these situations at a higher cognitive function, um, but I'll go on anyway, I can't, I'll go into more detail about that, but the first and foremost thing we should probably discuss, like I was saying before, is inducing hallucinations. So there's a variety of ways to induce hallucinations, most notably, and the first easy one, psychedelics. Second, more committed one, meditation. Third, uh, is an induction thing, so someone teaches you how to do it, or you might naturally discover it over time, which I think is kind of how it happened to me is shamanic ritual and then there's also visualization techniques such as tai chi and qigong which can all enhance the sense through visualization until you come to navigate things uh like intuitively or a certain level where the visualization has gone beyond visualization has actually become a, a, a capacity of the brain and there's various perceptions of which way that works but so first topic, psychedelics. Psychedelics are a quick and essentially a very effective route to inducing hallucinations, but can often result in psychological trauma, sincerely, uh, when not used in a safe and supportive and contextually appropriate environment. And I would personally suggest sticking, steering clear of this route unless used by and with someone with prior experience of psychedelics and a strong grounding in everyday consciousness and reality and that's what I wrote, but as a further preface, I don't advocate the use of hallucinogens. I may describe them in the videos. I may describe my own experiences from way in the past of them and how it's been beneficial to me, but I'm not condoning it or encouraging it formally. I'm saying that I've said this before, but this is re this is like re rekindling the series of videos. So I thought I'd reemphasize that at this point because I'm basically talking about psychedelics. And I wanted to emphasize that specifically because I'm about to say the phrase, the upside to psychedelics is that. So when used correctly and with a bit of, or quite a lot of good luck, one can experience life-changingly beautiful visions of parallel worlds and see their every thought manifest as a, in, on a perceptually vivid realm of consciousness accessible simultaneously with, at least in your perception, the more typical five sen five, typical data of the five senses not removed or distorted significantly enough to put them in any danger of physical harm. Let me clarify. So you can access other realms in as far as it appears due to psychedelic use or psychedelic states or ag states of agitation, but we'll come back to that. Um, without leaving this reality more or less, so you can still sort of perceive reality as perfectly normal. If anyone's ever smoked weed, for example, you get or like ecstasy or various other sort of supposedly more benign chemicals um, as opposed to like LSD or DMT or something more very powerful and potentially risky or like magic mushrooms is a, a low dose of magic mushrooms, things like that. You can more or less perceive things completely differently without losing touch with reality and it can be life changingly beautiful. Uh, one can experience in these states, it's been regularly recorded, shared visions or shared hallucinations, a sense of heightened empathy, a kind of hyper lucidity in relation to your place in the world and the meaning of your own existence, as well as access to parts of the mind that were previously either unused or unknown to the individual. And I'm going to add to that or suppressed. So part of the thing, something that was part of your psyche, but then has been lost. And then it can be reintroduced by psychedelics. So that can be amazing or incredibly dangerous depending on what it is that's been suppressed and it's called it's called the suppressed unconscious i can't remember who worked on it it was um 
It was a delineation of Freud's work where he's talking about rather than repression, like in Freudian psychology or psychoanalytics, it's suppression whereby something has been blocked out of the conscious mind through willful effect or trauma or just it being undesirable uh, or disowned in some sort of way and suppressed to the point where you're no longer conscious of it. It doesn't mean it's not functioning or there. But for a lot of people that can be really healing because it means that they connect with things and it does a lot of psychotherapeutic work and but it can also be very harmful so just it's, i'm again not advocating this route is i'm just describing it as a potential avenue of how you might become comfortable with or understand or relate to spontaneous stimuli-less data so the user may experience a sense of oneness wholeness and interconnectivity with not only their fellow human beings but of all nature and the universe at large which if you know anything about the process of enlightenment in buddhism it's essentially that sensation but in a very small snippet that you just sort of look through the window stick your head out and you're like fuck okay this is what it must be like to be enlightened then you sober up and it leaves a bit of a sensation with you but it's not a permanent transition which leads me nicely into meditation so meditation can be used as a tool for self-exploration which can in turn also lead to the sense of oneness interconnectivity previously mentioned it can also be a way or a method with which one can navigate one's own psyche in a progressive and especially comparatively but relatively safe way <coughs> there's also great potential for what the buddhists refer to as becoming enlightened or the state of enlightenment and it is described as a great remembering or a becoming of self-realization and bliss accompanied by seemingly on the way up at least at strange powers or perceptions of realities from the perspective of what they call no self that is to say they cease to identify themselves with the egoic state of having individual consciousnesses or the individual consciousness that defines itself as separate but indeed cease to identify with the concept of being a separate entity from the universe itself and thus re reach the aforementioned state of universal oneness and bliss it's also a really good way to learn about mental capacities because you can observe things something sam harris was talking about that's quite interesting about like the space behind your eyes so when you've got your eyes closed i've again various situations i was really pleased to see him bring this up because i hadn't come across it in uh less trippy or surrealist or hippie oriented environment i thought it was just me being weird more or less anyway uh there's a space behind your eyes so if you close your eyes it's pretty much just black or there's like scattered information or like almost a rouge color through your eyelids but then if you actually look into that space and actually like so rather than just having your eyes off you have them on but looking into that space and you get this kind of sense of like there's actually stuff there or like like i quite often get it when i look through my eyes i can still sort of perceive the room like even though it's not i'm not directly perceiving it and like i can see my hands moving and i can see objects and stuff it's a bit like i imagine people who are very visually impaired have but there's still like this framework of the room around you but you can also in that visualization space there or that openness to seeing things there you might get colors and shapes and things that are really really trippy and you just focusing your attention on what it looks like with your eyes closed can open up this whole uh perceptual realm of information um which is relevant to this sort of conscious hallucination but also uh there's so many different ways in which you can apply meditative techniques and just the process of focusing your awareness your conscious awareness on something that you don't normally focus on that i've used to calm my psyche initially but then also a lot of my hallucinations are spontaneous but then i've learned to navigate them better by being able to consciously focus on them and then train that focus more and more and more until i actually can perceive what am i hallucinating when i feel uh pressure from someone when they're upset or a uh, softness when they love me or being affectionate without directly touching me or or the sensation of being touched or held or attacked or any of these various things and like that training of like the focal point of the mind you can actually really zero in but 
you need to do it in such a way that it's calm, focused, practiced and rational. So, but you can do amazing things with meditation processes and it's literally something as simple as just focusing on a certain thing like, and drawing your attention into it and what sensations are there, what visual images, what auditory images are there and it opens up this whole spectrum of like uh, potential experiences that are just there, you just sat there having these experiences and they're quite, they can be quite profound and life changing. So, and th that, that is the method I would recommend rather than psychedelics, for example, or like, you know, the shortcut or the quick answer or the window, like you want to look in through a door, calmly walk through it, make look, look around, make sure it's safe and then kind of walk through and close the door to where you were before or keep the door open and tear all the walls down and be everywhere all at once. I don't know. Um, kind of off topic a little bit, but the next subject is shamanic ritual. So shamanic ritual is used for attaining states of or altered states of consciousness through the practice of, for example, dancing, music, trance induction, psychoactive plants and chemical compounds extracted from these plants. Oh, sorry, as well as trance induction and the practices of lucid dreaming and astral travel. And again, these sound like mystical things, but I'm more talking about them in terms of these are experientially available phenomena, whether they like when I use the term astral travel, doesn't necessarily mean you've left your body and gone to another reality, but the sensation that you have done that can be incredibly vivid and useful, uh, especially when it comes to um, navigating the your perception of reality. And I'll, I'll read what I've written because I'm, I'm getting a bit off topic. But these induced <coughs> altered states are then used to contact spirits or otherworldly beings so as to gain powers and healing abilities as well as knowledge about the deep workings of the, our world and the universe as a whole. These, and I put it in little inverted commas, these spirits often pass on what is perceived to be sacred knowledge as well as engaging in things like battle as either enemies or spirit guides, so helping uh, respectively. Lucid dreaming and astral travel, sometimes in accompaniment with drugs, sometimes in accompaniment with things that are less drug oriented, which is actually more common these days than the drug oriented thing, although it's becoming very popular, uh, especially things like ayahuasca and um, iboga or actually iboga is a bit brutal one apparently, but I've never tried ayahuasca either, so I don't know anything about either of those two, but my point being that it's becoming more popular to use psychedelics in accompaniment with like actual shamanism. Um, well, the point is that lucid dreaming and astral travel are two methods in which the shaman might contact spirits and other levels of reality, at least believe they have or glean useful information because they perceive that. Lucid dreaming is most accurately described, this is in my own personal experience, as being awake whilst being physically asleep. And for the person experiencing this, it is like a hyper vivid dream where one can control and manipulate the environment through thought alone, as well as, or sometimes separately experiencing parallel realities which i can personally testify to this and lots of people can it's just not that common because it's incredibly hard to train in uh, but parallel realities which seem more realistic or almost hyper realistic in comparison to normal everyday waking reality this can be profoundly moving and compelling to the dreamer and enable them purportedly to bring back powers and knowledge to the waking world having discovered them in the lucid dream state so that's the sort of the spiritual stuff that you can learn how to navigate, how to hallucinate, basically. So the basic gist is whatever method you choose, you need to become comfortable if you want to be really effective with telepathy, with rationally and calmly experiencing a hallucination, in my opinion, or at least seemingly extra sensory perceptions or or altered knowledge or really interesting correlations between things um, but staying grounded and rational um, and they can be really useful so the parallel of this now is the next section which is hypnotism and the power of belief um, a further potential avenue for manifesting hallucinations would be self-hypnosis it is i believe at least theoretically possible to create a feedback loop because so this is what I experienced straight away 
And then this is how I explain how I heard telepathic impressions in the form of voices that seem to be profoundly accurate based on seeing people or not even hearing their voice, hearing them speak in my head and then it was more or less exactly their voice or felt felt like what I heard was definitely them before I'd even seen them speak and this been looking at them, heard their voice, never heard them speak before and got it, at least to my perception, very accurate. But it's to do with a feedback loop where one automatically produces, this is how I explain my own voices and stuff, it's an automatic production of speech thoughts that convey, convey a fairly concise representation of what someone's thoughts are based on the intuitive reaction to them and their facial expressions. And there we go. I, however, I've only studied this as a theoretical explanation for the phenomena of voice hearing and more research and evidence, probably by people that are actually scientists instead of just schizophrenic people. Um, is required before saying anything with any conviction, certainly before suggesting attempting this particular methodology, because I wouldn't know how to go about it more or less. Like, But this is just a theoretical framework for how others might experience it. Um, so that said, as an example of what I'm talking about, one could set could conditions of having the receiver listen for mental chatter. So I do the opposite of this, which is how I figured if you do it the other way around, it might work. So I try to cut mental chatter and ignore and block out all these things to make life more navigable. But if you were to consciously listen for mental chatter and notate and convey verbally any distinct voices or thoughts or spontaneous or externalized or external seeming thoughts, whilst the sender also makes notes, notes and conveys verbally what they're sending, we could even videotape it or audio record it to see what, if anything was going on there um, and to check the notes afterwards this could further be oh yeah this could also further be facilitated by recording the dialogue and attempting to correlate from both parties and observing the cues that are being given one could then further seek out to attenuate oneself with the feeling of subtleties of what it's like when the dialogue is accurate so I more or less have done this last bit like when I thought I was telepathic I was like I'm gonna train this in and see if this works like, how can I get better at this? So, and this is how I did it, which is to, when I was having what I perceived to be genuinely telepathic experiences through these psychedelic or altered state or extreme fear scenarios, um, I would feel like I'd correlate, and I just, because I was just, it's so embarrassing, but like, I would just say, did you just think this? Or were you thinking that? Or do you feel this way? despite it not being necessarily apparent and it got to the point where it, it, a, it was really humiliating for ages and then it got to the point where people started saying oh you're cold reading or like how did you know that or uh, it's like you're spinning me out man or whatever just some sort of like yeah it became like more practicable basically and you sort of hone it and this is like I said here similarly to the empathic and intuitive processes mentioned prior so to clarify, this idea is yet untested and possibly unsafe and requires a lot more research to verify because it could just basically induce voice hearing, which is like be terrible, uh, in my opinion, especially if you couldn't control it. Like, um, So, yeah, but it requires a lot more research to verify or dismiss its validity as a methodology for telepathic communications, which leads me nicely to my next subject, altered states of consciousness, shared hallucination and the potential of thought experiments. So we'll come back to that in a second. Altered states of consciousness, tripping out on thought, shared hallucination. So this section, I um, don't need to emphasize it more because it's specifically written here. This section is specifically and emphatically not meant as any kind of scientific documentation or even attempt at being in any way scientific. So today I found no evidence to this theory, so please be open-minded and skeptical as I do not intend to even involve any statements of fact I wanted to make thoroughly clear it is purely speculation. So with that preface, I would like to speculate that based on past experience and also purely anecdotal corroborations and correlations, it would seem likely that there are people able to share vivid and detailed hallucinations and that my only viable explanation for this so far, and I did say it's not scientific, this is just speculation, is that the brainwave frequencies that they emit and receive through entering into altered states. So 
um, saw a little thing that was interesting recently about um, there's basically little magnetic bits in the brain, little magnetic receivers, um, and there's also oh, I, I'm not even going to go into that actually, but this is my explanation. Like, the only thing I can think of is that when you're tuned into the same brain frequency wave, you start to effectively be able to perceive the same subtleties of reality or the same information as someone else through that shared perception. So it's well documented that people can enter different states of consciousness, be it through meditation, drug use or direct electrical stimulation of the brain. What remains unclear is whether these states are able to create mutual realities that are not part of everyday reality, but thus experientially available to multiple people at once. Although I would argue that in my own experience and lots of anecdotal data, which isn't scientifically viable, but I've certainly come across a lot of people who experience similar things, similar hallucinations, similar perceptions of reality that seem very specific to them. And I've observed this outwardly as well as being part of it, um, where you do have more or less what could be best described as shared hallucinations that are painfully accurate to both people like so they both have the same information coming in um one noticeable example of this is the prevalence of people who use hallucinogenic drugs being able to perceive, perceive the movements of chi energy uh, often discussed by practitioners of chi tai chi or chi gong it would seem similarly that like children and play something that is thought to be purely of the realm of fancy or visualization has a tangible and observable presence and can most importantly be observed and interacted with by multiple people at once. So kids can imagine they're talking about the same thing, but that imagining more or less creates that reality and they're, they're able to interact as though that's real. Whereas in, and it sort of blurs the line between, is that their imagination or are they actually kind of perceiving it? Because my own memories of childhood was like, these were real events occurring. I could follow the dialogue. I, I contributed to it validly. And it was like a, like a story or a weaving of reality where it was like a shared thing, uh, which I would associate with theta waves that die off about the age of 12, when you start to lose your imagination to, in advance of puberty. So there could be some correlation with theta waves there. I don't know. It's just some vague thing I read, but it was a while ago, so I can't correlate it exactly. But like drunk people behave drunk with drunk people and they get on better with drunk people, people on acid get on better with people on acid, people who are stoned feel mutual, uh, like a mutual space around them. Um, it's like you come into sync with each other's brain waves and there's some evidence that I've come across before. I said it wasn't going to be scientific so I don't feel bad about not citing or referencing this, but um, between mothers and children there's the their heart rate sync and things like that. and. Uh, there's, they can very much sense how far away or how close they are and there's, there's like a innate electrochemical rapport that at distance is still felt and all these kind of things but my only conclusion without any bearing in scientific thought or rational scientific thought processes or rational thinking would be to hazard a very uneducated guess that when people enter the particular range of frequency range of brainwaves then they must sort of resonate or tune in or something have a commonality experience and perception with others in the same state i guess wildly now that it may be simply yeah this is what i was saying before wildly now it may be similar to where people in childhood are able to visualize play as though it was deeply real and this imaginary uh, realm or thing they're doing at they're experiencing has a vibrancy and vividness more commonly associated with children under 12 whilst playing it must be to do with and I speculated theta waves because I read something that suggested this resonating with one another, allowing a kind of shared visionary state effectively. So I might be wrong about the, the exact form of waves, but I, the memory serves its theta waves. Um, I'll not go on further about this idea. Now I'll say the jury is still out until I find out otherwise, but you'll certainly make an interesting avenue of research. Something, however, that maintains a, de maintains a decent level of measurability and evidenceable data is psychological modelling, and that should be our next topic. So, modelling and internalisation. 
I talked about this a bit earlier, but this is a bit more of an elaboration on it because I forgot this was in the text because I haven't actually read this before I started reading it. Um, a common human trait is to copy their parents when they're young. A lesser known trait is that they also create a copy of their parents internally. So this is where the, copy, the child copies the adult through mimicry and repetition until the parent or whoever they're modelling is no longer needed to instigate or supervise the action as an internal model of that person or their character traits has been created that instructs and guides the child internally or indeed integrates the characteristics into their own behaviour thus believing it to be themselves so it literally takes someone into yourself and it becomes you or part of you and this is also known as social learning or modelling I said this earlier this is also commonly seen in couples who have been together for years who have created such complex and intricate models of each other that very little if any external verification is required to convey huge volumes of meaning and dialogue so to come back to why this is relevant I think this social learning trait can be adapted and integrated into this creation of telepathy. Alongside the previously mentioned techniques, I believe that modelling is a very useful way to create an efficient, at least, illusion of telepathy. For example, with someone you've known for quite a while, especially if they've recently upset you, have you ever found yourself with a full-blown internal dialogue with the person that it's seemingly very accurate, if not, excrued, not skewed by your own annoyance or their annoyance if you're perceiving them? So you might get a pretty accurate representation of what the individual would say, only to have that almost exact conversation with them the next time you see them with remarkably similar outcomes. Uh, perhaps that's just me, like it says that, and it's, I'm conscious of that. But the idea seems theoretically sound, I guess. If you can model someone <coughs> <coughs> excuse me, accurately enough to hold a dialogue with them when they're not even there, especially an accurate dialogue, Imagine what could be possible to convey when they are there in person. An example of this is you could get someone to write down specific things about our emotions or a set of responses to questions you have written and try to accurately guess what they are writing based on your observations and then attempt to do this on the fly as a form of predictive exercise. With enough practice and honesty and on both regards, so being honest that you've failed and that you've succeeded in both ways, so not to create any false positives or positive falsifications, uh, with enough practice, it can become a handy way of creating a deeper form of dialogue where you're able to get engage in more honest conversation as you admit you're able to read each other, which is the hardest part about it, is dropping your guard and actually realising that, yes, we're all pretending we can't see exactly what other people are feeling. And we quite often look away from someone to give them privacy and think about something else. If they're, if, And there's loads of triggers in that in a very... A very complex social dance that goes on where people are given room for their thoughts almost like it seems like but um, you engage in a more honest conversation where you admit you're able to read each other and are thus comfortable with each other's true emotions that lie beneath and it can in fact be quite a cathartic process um, I don't know whether I go into this actually in the document but it says I must have intended to do this but apparently I'll go into later greater detail later on about how to set up telepathic bonds with people including the holy moment exercise which if it's not in the text I can describe I got it from a film called I adapted it from a film called Waking Life so you might if you've seen Waking Life remember the holy moment scene and that's where I got the idea from so ESP and evolutionary strategies surely by now you're spurious um, have you seen any, someone crying and genuinely felt anguish of your own from observing someone suffering? Have you ever been walking down the street and felt suddenly compelled to look around and find yourself locked in the eyes of someone who's staring at you? So these are two examples of sensors that are not usually attributed to extrasensory perception and are usually shrugged off as either coincidence or simply normal things and they definitely are normal things. But you also, it's such a common occurrence that you don't even register it because it seems normal. So it doesn't stand out as some sort of like, that person was looking at me at the right time. It's like you just, you, people just go boom, 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 and clock each other perfectly in sync. Like you can watch it, it's like a dance. It's really interesting. Uh, yeah, I've said that dance thing before, but it is, there's like a play, there's a flow, there's a fluidity to it. It's really interesting once you start to observe these things. Um, one is, so, 
One is empathy, potentially from mirror neuron, neurons and our own sense of compassion and sympathy made succinct by our own emotional reaction. So that would be the genuine anguish from experiencing someone else suffering. So it's not just compassion, but it's feeling what they're feeling and then having compassion that they feel like that. And then it's made even more powerful by our own emotional reaction to feeling that they feel that way as well as actually feeling it. So it's, a, yeah, I briefly made mention of empathy before, so I'll keep it, the discussion of it necessarily brief here also. The latter, however, may be an underused sense from the days when humans suffered predation from other animals and lived in the wild themselves. And I've read articles which suggest all animals have this sense, but it is dulled in humans. Uh, see Rupert Sheldrake, regardless of your opinion of him, it's quite interesting to read, uh, The Sense of Being Stared At. There's a, I think it's a book or a video or an article. I think it's a book. Um, yeah, I haven't got the book though, but I'm, I've seen lots of information about it because I'm quite a fan of Rupert Sheldrake because I've used a lot of his experimental data or anecdotal data or however he collects it um, to explain the ex phenomena I experience or at least come up with some of my ideas for the more rational versions of what I experience. So I found in my own experimentation with em empathy that I feel a subjective replica of people's emotional state with a high degree of accuracy Sometimes where it really bugs me as well because I can't I can't I can't detach myself from other people's emotions and I've had to learn blocking exercises and clearing exercises which I think I might go into again if it's not in the remainder of the text um, but as though I'm feeling their their emotions not my own so I become aware that that's sort of what I'm saying it's like I feel like I will take on their emotions and I'll be completely fine before going into the situation and then I will start to vividly feel as though it's my own emotion but distinctly aware that it's coming from an external source so that's quite interesting sort of experience I've also noticed that I'm able to sense with ever increasing accuracy when I'm being looked at I talked about this earlier a game for people to test their own sensitivity to that looked at observation uh, this game involves two people one who looks and one who guesses the looker must not look away, but deliberately focus on another object when looking away and focus hard on the person when looking. So, like, you have to not only look at them, but, like, I don't know, send your... In it's not like send your intention. It's like... That's a stupid way of putting it, but it's like you have to be focused on them for, for this to work because you can focus away from them. And, like, say I'm looking in my peripheral vision, I've got a whiteboard here. I'm looking into the camera, but I'm also looking down at here. And I'm, whereas when I'm focused in on you, I'm looking directly into the lens, but I've got no one to look at, so it's hard to focus. But I'm, there's a difference between that. Uh, I don't know whether it's demonstrable on camera, but the difference between that and sort of a less focused version. But when you when you do it in person, it becomes apparent that there's some relevance to whether you're focused on them as well as looking at them or not. Uh, best way I can explain it. Uh, so the, the deliberately focus on another object when looking away and focus hard on the person when looking. The guessing player must cover their eyes and guess five attempts at a time, switching side after each five attempts. This is to ensure that it's fair and cohesive, but also to make sure that the person looking is focusing correctly, as it gives both players a chance to get an idea of what's being sensed for. I did a similar thing with a friend of mine where we held up playing cards face away um, and we took it in turns to guess uh, what's what whether they were red or black basically and we're both musicians so apparently we purportedly do quite well in these sort of tests anyway because we're musicians there's been quite a few studies into that we musicians tend to score higher than accurate higher than chance on intuitive tests of, because they're and the theory is that it's they're more able to read subtle uh, body language cues or facial cues because they use used to communicating through music as well as non-verbal cues because especially if they're a singer or if they're focused on their instrument they can't necessarily focus on speaking at the same time but you get a sense of when the music's about to flow somewhere all these kind of things but um we got only about 10 percent, but we got higher than chance i can't remember what the exact statistics were but we worked out we were scoring about 10 percent or 15 percent higher than chance which isn't that significant but chance is as effectively i can't remember how we worked it out but it's like it's 50 50 
and we were scoring like 60 and 70 percent of the cards were accurate but i don't know what the actual math is we wrote it all down and worked it out but maybe try that as well but yeah i found for example in regards to this looking at each other sensing when people are looking test that it's possible to make someone think you're looking at them when you're looking away by keeping your focus on them during the exercise and vice versa but you can look at then you can look at the them but focus elsewhere and the effect will be reversed so you can actually fool people into thinking that you're not looking at them when you are and kind of dim your projection of yourself so that that i always find really interesting because like i can look at someone and then I can withdraw myself from it and I get like a physical sense of that and they don't know I'm looking at them. But as soon as I actually actively focus on them, they look around or they look startled or something happens. I've done this out and about, but I've also done it in this kind of more restricted testing environment. So it's, it's quite fun, to uh, sense if nothing else. So now here comes the slightly controversial part, which is again, at the moment, a hypothetical at this point. The idea is that once you have the person looking at you with your eyes closed, you can attempt to hear or feel out what they're trying to send to you through your emotions and mental chatter. And then when they are focusing away, you can attempt to guess something they're hiding from you. So using the aforementioned previous methods, you can, yeah, you develop a sensitivity to whether they're hiding or projecting. And they often are inversed actually, which is a very peculiar thing, but for the latter part, it would be easier to have a choice of pre-agreed uh, choices such as five words or they can pick that they can pick from to project or hide so you aren't getting any risk, at least in the early stages, of doing anything too painful or offensive because I've really upset people with kind of reading and stuff like that. Using these ideas really, really upset them because I get to the point where the last thing, like uh, tarot reading is a very interesting one to utilise all these skills with. Um, but it keeps it playful and, and develops trust further too if you aren't doing anything too interpersonal. But you can be quite invasive with how much information you can intuit about someone if you just straight up observe them honestly and just feed back to them what you're perceiving in all these different ways. And I think, yeah, we've got one more section. So now we've got through the theories and ideas, all of the above, this, we'll see how this can be applied to become a useful and measurable, measurable skill set, um, or further adapted to become, like to train yourself basically. So that'll be section three, I'll be back in Ona Momento. So this section is based on um, another article I wrote called Transverbal Synesthetic Communication, and here I've entitled it that with integrating it all to create the illusion. Um, I've done, I think, quite a long video discussing this otherwise, so you can either jump into that, which I might put in the description, a uh, link to it, uh, we'll see. But um, I'll just straight up read this bit because it's quite complex and I'm sure I'll think of things to elaborate on it with. Um, transverbal communication or transverbal synesthetic communication is a methodology that will, this is probably naive, but published hopefully in the near future, discussing how to integrate psychotic hallucinations into a usable restorative skill, but the method can be applied to people who have not suffered any psychotic illness whatsoever, and I'll explain it briefly here. So transverbal, in this context, I'm re reapplying the word. Uh, so it's hyphenated rather than one word because one word is specifically a thing already transverbal um, and I believe transverbal hyphenated that's how I've distinguished it it means to transcend the verbal and it isn't meant in any grandiose or spiritual fashion but more that it includes all forms of verbal and non-verbal communication integrated as a whole to form a new whole beyond simply those forms and the key aspect to the process is patience and self-honesty if you're not accurate with your transverbal practice you must be sure to acknowledge it as you will not progress based on false positives so to practice transverbal communication the synesthesia comes into the hallucinations aspect i don't think i've covered this here but in the other video it covers it quite distinctly um so in to practice transverbal communication we need to outline what it is and which techniques are used the practices are reading and projection of the following forms of communication, body language, 
sub and paraverbal language, verbal language and implied meaning, subtext and shared metaphorical language, synesthesia, so that's where the synesthetic comes in, synesthesia or hallucinatory perceptions. So body language has already been discussed in this article, but what hasn't been discussed is the link between facial expression and intuitive knowing. That's it, Malcolm, Malcolm Gladwell. In Malcolm Gladwell's book, Blink, he discusses the concept of the face being a map of the entire structure of the mind, or relatively speaking, uh, in a combination of, uh, I can't remember exactly how many, but something like 44 major muscle groups with a combination of 445,000 combinations or something. Not quite sure, you'll have to read the book. I might even type that in here, we'll see how it goes. Um, he discusses the concept of the face being a map of the entire structure of the mind, or at least the conscious mind, represented facially through complex and intricate patterns of movements of the face. These micro-expressions are an important feature of relevance here. They can often be misread by over-analytical people or those who are untrained, and more often than not, they can, be perceived, they can only be perceived intuitively rather than consciously, with the majority of the f ex micro expressions only identifiable when a recording is made and the footage is later analysed and sometimes it has to be slowed down so slow just to see one flash of a facial expression that it's like one frame. Um, but I can highly recommend to read Blink for further study on this particular subject. I would simply offer that learning to read body language can be as much about reading yourself and your subconscious responses, responses as it is about the other person. Sub and paraverbal language. We can all recognize a sigh of relief or a groan of exasperation, but these often autonomous or uncontrolled or unconscious or non-deliberate expressions can also be extremely revealing. The exact tone and timing of these non-linguistic forms of communication can reveal a lot about the person's state of mind, um, but may not be entirely noticed by the person using them. It's sort of a reflex response. They can also be deliberate. A faux yawn or a bored grunt can say a lot more about a person's mood than anything they're saying with words. It's also important to be aware that of these to have a full view of the dialogue between two people. Verbal language and implied meaning. With speech, people are often conveying more with their tone of voice and posture or facial expression than they are with the words. But the words themselves can hold an interesting set of data about the how the person is in con attempting to convey themselves. For example, we know that it is common to speak more clearly and with better diction in the be the there we go, like I said diction, anyway, in a well-dictioned like way, um, than in the presence of a boss or authority figure, and is perhaps to use more complex language as one's intellectual, intellectual inferiors to, so as to assert intelligence. Another example would be the prompts given in verbal dialogue, such as pauses to check the person is listening, overuse of certain types of words when trying to attract a partner, such as sexually charged words, cautious use or avoidance of words with potentially aggressive connotations when in conflict, or indeed the opposite. So you might drop in more aggressively connotated words to incite violence on someone else's behalf because you want to be violent to them or so just, there's loads of examples given there but just a brief elaboration and while some people are aware of this deliberate prompting and word choice other people merely adopt patterns they have developed through social learning and they're unaware of the connotations of such patterns other than an intuitive and emotion or emotional level and this has three interesting side effects if you're able to observe the patterns undetected, you can predict the aims and outcomes of certain conversations. B. You can interfere in said conversations and add your own in direction and intention to said conversation. A lot of these are like neurolinguistic programming techniques, um, but I've kind of elaborated on them in my own experience. Um, not to say that they're entirely original, but I got most of this from self-observation and stuff. So C. If more than one of the people in the conversation is aware of these prompts and implied but subtle processes of direction, you can essentially have a second conversation overlay, overlaid using the prompts from themselves or these prompts themselves as a form of dialogue. And C is to my mind where it becomes really interesting, especially in relevance to the rest of the video or the article. This is because it is possible with two people directly involved, and you'll often see this between two people flirting. There is sometimes a second or even third dialogue 
whereby the people can be verbally and physically observed to be having a conversation about painting, for example, but they may be conveying arousal in their bodies, but restraint in the tone of the voice with a subtly provocative language, all while assessing each other and having a battle of wits, to which an external person not paying particular attention might just seem like a normal friendly chat. And this further interests me as, to, as a point of telepathy. If it's possible to have a subtext dialogue with someone, perhaps unbeknownst to them, and this I have done, and I'm not saying it's very moral, but sometimes you get in difficult situations where you need to do this, you could find out and convey a large amount of data, so you could find, receive and send, more or less, we're saying, a large amount of data without ever discussing the actual topic you're assessing. Now, the last things I haven't done for this article, so that's essentially the whole article, and I think that last bit's my favourite bit. But the, what I haven't finished is speed intuition and instincts, training the psyche to interpret information, the importance of being honest with yourself, the dangers of delusion, empathy training, practices for feeling your way through a telepathic dialogue, mystical practices, controlled hallucination and altered states, and creating telepathic bonds and the holy moment and other rituals. So I'm just going to briefly summarise based on these bullet points because I haven't written this bit yet. Because I, I just found this article, I forgot I hadn't finished it. I think I may have even finished it on another computer and I just don't have it saved. But speed intuition is quite often discussed in Blink, the book I was saying by Malcolm Gladwell. And it's basically learning to, when to trust your instincts, when to use the falsification of your instincts or the false positives in your instincts to figure out what the actual accurate information is. So it's more or less practicing consciously doing everything that's all been discussed uh, without too much control over it. So just looking for hits, looking for misses, assessing them and then, in, and then training over time to get more and more and more and more hits until it, it is finely tuned. Um, the importance of being honest with yourself, the dangers of delusion, is the exact opposite of that. It's like when you don't do that, when you're not honest with yourself, you can latch onto insecurities, you can make a fool of yourself, you can sometimes even uh, fall into quite dangerous mental processes by thinking you know what's going on and getting an entirely disparate version of reality based on your own paranoia and reattribute the senses and perceptions that are actually accurate in the initial phase but because of how you're interpreting them and your process not being honest and monitored and externally verified you might be taking the same set of signals as everyone else and thinking something horrible is happening or something amazing is happening when it's not in either of those cases so that's just a brief summary of why intellectual self-honesty i believe the term is but basically just really being straight up and verifying and being safe with it because you can become quite delusional uh, or feel in very empowered and become dangerous or anything like that but the dangers of delusion can be very relevant to all of this as i'm sure you may have probably flagged up a number of times since i've been talking um empathy training practice your way through f practice feeling your way through a telepathic dialogue so kind of went over that before but it's just it's just basically putting your mind in a state of passivity um feeling comfortable and confident enough that you can relax around your mind so that you can experience all the information that's coming in um like a radio receiver rather than most people to me i experience them as just rocket heads firing out endless sources of information it's only when they're in direct conversation with someone that that becomes a multi uh, a channeled process otherwise they're just firing out data and that's what I was saying about giving people privacy for their own thoughts and stuff um, and it's just training that sense of like um, getting comfortable with feeling these things on a regular basis so that you don't need to shut those experiences down um, and in, with all the practices that have been discussed before um, learning to sense your way through without not necessarily always knowing exactly what's going on and that can generally be done by like self-monitoring like unless you particularly struggle with social cues and even then when you struggle with social cues this can enhance that process 
and make it so that you struggle less with social cues is really, really becoming self-aware of what your emotional response is to the situation and someone else's or, um, but doing just basically practicing, not saying things or not consciously looking at what you're supposed to focus at, which is like, you're, you're watching, maybe watching me speak, or you may be watching my hand gestures, but you're not necessarily more. Most people wouldn't be, you may be, but you wouldn't necessarily be just taking in the tone. So like uh, it's a bit of self analysis. I'm slightly agitated, too much caffeine. I'm very enthused about the subject. I'm talking in a direct tone uh, because I feel informed on the subject. There's also an air of skepticism in my own voice, possibly a raising of tone into a less formal context when context when I am spurious about what I'm saying, so as to navigate that. There's also my body language, which you can see very little of, but you can see my facial expression. Uh, let's see, let's see. Confusion on the left eye, a kind of guarded, gated thing there. I've got my right eyebrow raised, suggesting that I'm asserting dominance over myself now because I'm seeing my own reflection. Uh, a subtle smile in this corner of the mouth, and you know, all these kind of things. It's just like there's so many cues and sets of information that I can even I can look to the right here on my other monitor and see myself. Um, and it's just basically learning to become very, very comfortable with these seemingly extrasensory processes until they're natural and then you will suddenly there'll be a click moment eventually down the line because i had the click moment first and then figured out what it all fucking was um which took me years so i'd prefer if people were going to do this they would do it the other way around and then gradually introduce it and then you'll just get like the the click moment like i had where like suddenly you have all these perceptions but what i didn't have when i had the click moment was the ability to control or navigate them healthily and that took me years to figure that out um so yeah it's just like a gradual build up learning to shut down your mind and cut off these perceptions if necessary things like that uh the next section at this end part is mystical practices controlled hallucination and altered states i'm not going to say much more about that than i did earlier in the sort of buddhism and shamanism thing but it's effectively similarly to empathy and the sensations that might be arising and the feelings that might be arising and the things that you might get as sort of relatively normal sensory experiences, learning to let yourself drift into a trippier state and observing what's there without being freaked out by it or trying to control it and just observe naturally. Uh, and you might hear a voice. It might be once happened in your life, but you might be very comfortable. Some people like identify voices as their own thoughts that are externalized or even they don't even think it's externalized they just they might think in the head in voices like my i'm very conscious of my voices because i've struggled with them but for most people that don't have mental damage or any kind of issue with it it's quite normal to sort of think in voices and stuff like that and navigate those and learning to navigate altered states in a calm way so that you can enter these relaxed uh, kind of trippy states and feel comfortable and just gradually introducing meditative techniques or altered states into day-to-day -day life or in, in situations where it's safe and calm and comfortable to do uh, until similar to the empathic and normal sensory data um, you're able to kind of trip a little bit effectively or like drift into altered states without being uncomfortable with it um, and then, so that's just a rough gist of the mystical practices side of things. But essentially, essentially it involves picking a, a mystical discipline, practicing it until you've learned as much as you possibly can, and then trying to dissect it and understand it and use that mystical process in a non mystical way and kind of understand it for what's actually going on and digest it a bit. That's what I'm getting at. So, the la yeah, last section creating telepathic bonds, the holy moment, and other rituals. So I'm not going to detail any of the rituals because we've gone through quite a lot in this video and I'm pretty sure it's fairly long already. I can't really... Yeah, at least an hour or so. No, maybe not. Anyway, telepathic bonds. It's similar to modelling, but it's to the point where you consciously train that. Um, to the point that you more or less walk away from a situation having had direct interaction with someone and the narrative goes on in both heads simultaneously in the same way and then you come back and it's the same narrative again and it's almost as though they never left and they're just with you and the narrative keeps going 
um, between you, even though they're not there. And it may be very subtly in the background, but that's the most concise way I can describe telepathic bonds. There is in a little inverted commas. Um, the holy moment, uh, I would suggest watching a scene in a film called Waking Life, which is where I got the term from. But it's effectively looking straight into someone's eyes uh, without looking away necessarily not necessarily staring them down but holding their gaze for as long as possible and there's usually a couple of phases that go through this holy moment process where you have the initial kind of um it's either fear or aggression it's usually aggression then fear then a subtle arising of a kind of sweeter but combination between fear and affection and then when it drops quite often you'll be moved to tears or you'll feel a deep sense of peace and uh, you'll when you go into the state of such relaxation staring straight into someone and feel trusting of that um spontaneous love arises and it's not romantic love it's not sexual attraction all of those things drop off through the process and it just becomes this absolute honest like affection in a kind of, I want the best for you, I see everything about you, and you've nothing to fear. And, and as, every, as, as each of you drop your guy, guy, your guard, it becomes more and more and more tranquil. And for nine times out of ten, in fact, probably ten out of ten times I've done that with someone, um, my relationship with them outside of that moment has improved dramatically because they see a side of you that... And it's kind of like a resonance or a connection is established there through those holy moments whereby um, you've just seen each other. If you look for long enough and you're honest enough and can be calm enough, like you see almost a reflection of yourself or like an intuition of you're the same, you're the same thing. And whether that's an illusion or not, it's incredibly powerful and people are often moved to tears and it creates a great sense of camaraderie and very long lasting relationships very quickly. Um, and they don't have to be intimate or romantic relationships. It can enhance intimate and romantic relationships. And it goes on much further to the point where I've had people be able to describe the, f the hallucinations they might see because of keeping my gaze for so long and seeing different characters, different faces, different things drop off, different emotions, different parts of the face slowly phasing until you become into a one state and then you get like effectively in my own experience and other people's description when I do this with them it's like a bit of a halo or a sphere of light and the rest of the room starts to fade away and you end up effectively completely absorbed in one another and completely peaceful and calm and it's lovely and I've been deliberately staring at the camera this entire way through to sort of give you an idea of what that feels like but I don't know whether it'll actually work because A it's a camera and B I haven't been able to see my face because I'm holding direction with the camera um, and that's very rushed but I'm just trying to condense it down into um, a shorter period of time if this is interesting to you if it's bullshit let me know smash the like button smash the dislike button leave a cynical comment or a complimentary comment or a neutral comment or just let me know you've watched it, or possibly share it if you know someone might find it interesting. Um, yeah, so that's my telepathy analysis. So, au revoir.